no, not last weekend, but the weekend before. In Forsyth County in Georgia, a uh, high school student finished third in a cross country meet out of 266 participants. But when the race was over, he was listed as last. The reason for this was because he wore a headband with the scriptures, with the scripture heading Isaiah 40, 30 through 31. Not the words of that passage, just the reference. And for that, he was apparently disqualified, even though he wore the same headband in the last year's championship race and before the race this year, officials, race officials, okayed it. And why are these things happening? Let's ask this. They're happening all the time now. Because in an increasingly hostile environment to Christianity, the, our a right as Americans and as Christians, the free exercise of religion in the First Amendment is being redefined as the right to worship. Meaning that as long as we keep our religious rituals in the church house, we're okay. But if we, if we try, to, it's not okay to freely exercise our faith in the public square. But that is what the founders meant when they wrote the, the freedom of religion, the free exercise of religion, that's what they meant. Thus, we as Christians need to understand these things that are happening should be a wake-up call to Christians to do what Jesus has been telling us to do for 2,000 years, make disciples. To live our faith openly, boldly, without compromise while we still can. Which brings us this morning to our text. Because in order for us to live as Christians, and in order for us to make disciples, it means that we're going to have to do something that most of us are opposed to. We're going to have to change. I know that's an evil word, but we will. So take your Bible with me, and let's turn once again to Mark's Gospel. Mark's Gospel, chapter 2. Let's begin reading at verse 18, continuing where we left off last Sunday uh, at verse 18, and follow along with me as I read aloud. And John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and they came to him and said, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast? But your disciples do not fast. And Jesus said to them, While the bridegroom is with them, the attendants of the bridegroom do not fast, do they? So long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But in the, the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a patch on an unshrinked cloth on an old garment, otherwise the patch pulls away from it, and it's ruined, basically, what Jesus says. Now here's a key verse. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the new wine will burst the skins. The wine is lost, the skins as well, but one puts new wine into fresh wineskins. Continue. And it came about that he was passing through the grain fields on the Sabbath. And his disciples began to make their way along while picking the heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, See here, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus said to them, Have you never read? What David did when he was in need and became hungry and his companions and how the eternal house of God at the time of Abathar the high priest ate the consecrated bread which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priest and he gave it also to those who were with him and he was saying to them the Sabbath was made for man not man for the Sabbath and consequently the son of man is Lord of even the Sabbath a perpetual conflict between Jesus and the keepers of the new wine or the old wine bags occurred between, between them and it occurred over the issue of change. In our text this morning, we discover two encounters that Jesus had with the Pharisees, the religious establishment of his day. In both of them, Jesus introduced the prospect of change and the keepers of the old wineskins bowed their heads in resistance. Between these two encounters, note in verse 22 that Jesus used an interesting metaphor to describe his effect on the religious establishment. 
He says no one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, he pours new wine into new wineskins. The reason for that was old wineskins were brittle and, and dry. They didn't adapt well to new wine. New wine would cause the bags to crack and stretch and leak. The legalistic Jewish establishment, of course, were the old wineskins, and the new wine was represented by the teachings of Jesus. The Pharisees were suffering from hardening of the spiritual arteries. They were flabbergasted that Jesus invited Levi, a corrupt tax collector, to be one of his disciples, and they were angry that Jesus didn't practice the hyper-legalities of the Sabbath. Folks, the name of the vital Christian life is spelled C-H-A-N-G-E, change. The word sanctification is a theological word that it refers to our growth as Christians. And it implies that we should be constantly becoming more and more like Christ as we are changing. The transformation of an ugly, hostile spirit at war with God into a loving spirit of cooperation and fellowship is the goal of the Christian life. But this transformation can only occur because there is an inner change. Jesus kept challenging the rules, thus creating an intense battle between himself and the religious establishment. About 450 years ago, the French government, under King Charles IX, adopted a reform calendar which moved New Year's Day from April 1, where it had been for centuries, to January 1, where obviously it's been ever since. Needless to say, something so basic evoked an enormous social outcry uh, in society. The old New Year's Day became a battleground between those who were in favor of the change and those who resisted it. And guess what each group called the other in this particular conflict? If you guessed fool, you would be right. The stand patterns watching people chase after every new fad and betray the past would express their contempt by calling them fools. The others returned the compliment and labeled as fools those who resistors who were not able to cope with change and flow with the time. And this is how April Fool's Day on April 1st came into being. Yes, tradition is a tough nut to crack. On the other hand, growth at the opposite end of tradition presupposes change. In fact, for a growing person, there is nothing more permanent than change. But all this changing creates problems. New ways have to be found as old ways are a fail. New habits have to be formed as old habits are broken. New attitudes have to be adopted as old ones die. Look at any problem in your life and you will see some kind of change at the heart, at the root of it. There, there are many people who would like for their lives to be used to make a difference in the world in which we live, but who resist change because growth requires change, and change, as we all know, is risky. What is truly ironic is that the, the people who should be changing the most, God's people, are often the most resistant to change. I find that astonishing. That was indeed the Pharisees' problem. Jesus threatened their power, their control, and their status in the church. If they didn't want anything, anyone to change the way things were, no matter how bad they were. And of course, they were too blind and would not open their eyes just to see really how bad things were. They were happy with the status quo because they were in charge of the status quo. That was their most cherished value. Jesus was a change agent. He taught his disciples to be change agents. He established his church to be change agents in the culture in which we live. However, we have been more changed 
by a seriously degraded culture than being change agents in the culture in which we live. Why is that? Because of a pathological resistance to change. Six decades ago, Everett Rogers wrote a groundbreaking book entitled The Diffusion of Innovation. And in that book, he did, had done an extensive study about how change works. And Rogers concluded that it takes an innovation roughly 30 years to fully penetrate the target audience. His hypothesis was supported by the research of historian Arthur Schlesinger, who also discovered that political and social changes are like a pendulum swinging back and forth in 30-year cycles. However, that's changing. The technological changes that have insinuated themselves into our world for the last 30 years or so have constricted this change cycle to somewhere more on the order of two to four years. Millions of people still struggle, struggle making sense out of life now because they continue to live under the old axiom, well, I'll get used to it by and by, realizing that we no longer have the luxury of time to ease into new ideas and understand not all new ideas are good ideas if they're not godly ideas. And increasingly, many of the changes in our culture, and here I'm not speaking technologically, but morally are not good and godly ideas. Instead of speaking up and speaking out, many Christians, including a great many churches, have continued the tradition of going along to get along. The thinking seems to be as long as we can continue to do what we've always done, we'll just go along. Even if it means that we are forced to accept to compromise or violate our convictions and our consciences and increasingly the clear teachings of the Word of God. So how do we react as the followers of Jesus in a changing cultural environment? Well, take your Bible again. Look at the section we just read where the Jesus and the Pharisees got into this thing about fasting. The Pharisees' question basically was, well, John's disciples fast, the disciples of the Pharisees fast, why don't you fast, Jesus? Now, understand that fasting was only required one day a year and recommended during four other Jewish holidays, but none of those events were taking place at the time that the Pharisees confronted Jesus over the issue of fasting. It had been established by the Pharisees as a tradition, tradition that Mondays and Thursdays were days that people should be fasting, meaning that the issue now is not religious, but, listen, cultural. Thursday was also market day. And so here's what the self-righteous Pharisees did. They went in down Main Street calling attention to themselves, looking all haggard, worn, and tired, and hungry, so that everybody would see how spiritual they were because they were fasting. Jesus wasn't into playing those kinds of games, and so he just refused to participate. Jesus answered their inquiry, notice from the text, by asking the question of his own regarding another tradition. The Jewish wedding celebration. Essentially, what Jesus asked is this. You've been to a wedding celebration. Have you ever been to one where food was absent? Of course, he answers no. Because as a matter of fact, marriage celebrations in that time were, were of such a special nature that most wedding parties lasted a full week. Some laws were suspended even. People were allowed to miss work, and for a lot of people, that meant a rare break from bone-crushing labor. People would be crazy not to fast, uh, crazy too fast during such a festive occasion. 
the bride and groom would never be forgiven for not providing a feast to be remembered. Jesus here in our text likened himself to the bridegroom and his disciples to the attendants and the family and friends of a wedding party. And his message was essentially this, if you read that text that we just read. He was saying, I'm here, the Messiah. This is a time of rejoicing, not mourning, which was associated with fasting. They can fast all they want when I'm gone. The Pharisees' appetite for tradition stemmed from their obsession with controlling the religious activity of the people. Nowadays, increasingly, our government is trying to control the religious activity of the people. This should be a wake-up call to Christians, but has not proved to be so. Now, most of you know me pretty well. As a general rule of thumb, I am very apolitical in my preaching. I am beginning to change. Okay? I believe the state, meaning the government, is now a real threat to religious freedom. Don't misunderstand me. I am not reacting to any one presidential administration, but I believe in America right now, unless we wake up and change our way of thinking and responding to what is going on in the culture around us, we will soon lose not only our most fundamental rights as Christians and Americans, but we will also forfeit a huge opportunity to make a critical difference in our culture and in a time in our nation's history. Right now, our lives of Christian, as Christians in America are being invaded by secular forces who are opposed to the supernatural, forcing us to look at the challenges in our culture and respond appropriately before it is too late. And we will have to throw off the dead weight of tradition, which has been being apathetic or just going along to getting along in, and have to stand up and be counted. The Pharisees' problem is still with us today. Their security was in their tradition, not in trusting God. We don't trust God much. We trust in the political process. We trust in ballots. We trust in voting. We trust in a lot of things, but not God. And so if that, all, if that stuff doesn't work out, then we just hunker down and respond to the moral and spiritual challenges in our culture by trying to ride it out, and that's not going to work anymore. We're stuck in a rut because of our churches and Christians are silent, apathetic, and unmotivated. That has to change. We have to change. But it's a matter of who and what we trust. The U.S. Department of Transportation, less than 20 years ago now, set aside $200 million for research and testing of an automated highway system. This system would purportedly relieve traffic woes with super cruise control in heavily congested cities. Now, special magnets would be embedded in the asphalt every four feet and would transfer signals between vehicles and main computer systems. Steering, acceleration, and braking would be controlled by sensors, computers, navigation systems, and cameras along the side of the road. Control would then be returned to the drivers at their specified exit. Researchers and government officials at that time claimed that they had the technology to resolve any potential problem, but one challenge they had yet to meet, said Mike Doble, who was GM's technology manager at the time, the only thing we have yet to do is to get people to comfortably trust the system. 
it's not a technology issue, but would you drive closely spaced at high speeds through San Diego? Not many of us would. Trust is always the issue, folks. As long as we trust in the political process or the culture to stay the same or the go along to get along mentality, even at the risk of compromising our convictions, we will never be challenged to trust God and to speak up and speak out and invest ourselves into making a difference in the culture in which we live. Pharisee strategy was to maintain the organization at all costs, including crucifying Messiah. The Pharisees invested their time and their energies and their resources in keeping their traditions intact, their structure, structures secure, and especially their status unchanged. Jesus, on the other hand, look in your text again, invested in what? Meeting need. He was constantly being confronted by the religious establishment of his day in verses 23 through 28. Now note this. Jesus broke one of the rules set up by the Pharisees. They attacked him with a vengeance. Jesus' answer to them was to convey the idea that human need takes precedent over human law. The Sabbath was designed to give humankind enjoyment, not to enslave his spirit to a list of oppressing rules. The rules of the Pharisees were subtle, man-made means of oppressing people, creating guilty, frustrated, and unhappy legalists. They were designed to keep ministries from actually happening rather than making ministry possible. And shortly after this grain-picking incident that we just read about, Jesus was at the synagogue. First thing he did was he healed a man with a withered hand, which was considered work. And the Pharisees got all upset over that. Jesus seemed to be saying to them, I will move toward meeting human need, regardless of your obsession with tradition and your misunderstanding of God's law. And in the process, Jesus was determined to teach his disciples and his followers the priority of meeting need. So, it is of absolute importance that we remember that our chief task as a church is making disciples. That must always be at the forefront of our activity. That should consume much of our energy. But listen now. But we here in America face a very great danger. Not just we here are Christian, the country as a whole. The greatest need of every person in this country today is obviously the need to know God. I think few of us this morning would disagree with this most basic need. But increasingly, we live in a culture where we're not just pushing God to the margins but we are banishing God altogether. We need to get out of our rut as churches and start being serious about our role as Christians by being invested in the culture in which we live. We have been compliant too long. We have been silent too long. We have been too accommodating. It's time to be agents of change. So let me be clear, okay? If you think you're hearing call to arms or get out the vote plea or let's start a protest movement, you misunderstand me. My plea is Jesus' plea. Go make disciples. Witness one person at a time. But we can't even do that unless we change. No longer hiding our light by being disengaged from the culture or isolated from the culture, that has to change. I've been preaching this theme for more than 30 years, so this is nothing new for me. We get involved in our culture not to salvage our rights, but because Jesus has been calling us 
to live in the real world for 2,000 years, we must change. We must be engaged with our culture. We must be the people of God in our culture so that we can make a difference in our culture. And we can't do that if we are removed, isolated, and withdrawn from the culture. That's one of the big reasons that we are where we are right now. Every Christian should know the story of William Wilberforce. His is the story of what happens when you drag religion into the public square and when he allows it to affect how government behaves. As a result, the government was forced to abolish the slave trade. Don't you think the African slaves were glad that Wilberforce allowed his religion to affect his politics? Dietrich Bonhoeffer began to speak out against National Socialism and Hitler in particular in the 1930s in Germany and that put him on their hit list. He came to America to flee the coming persecution, but while he was here, God convicted him that he had to return to Germany to continue to speak up and to apply his faith in the face of coming evil. He was imprisoned and later murdered by the Nazis, but he is still speaking to us today warning us not to let ourselves be silenced. He called the church to be the church then. He is calling the church to be the church now, the American church, to stand up for what is right, knowing that if we do, the whole country will be blessed. Did you know that it was serious and devout Christians who started and sustained the abolitionist movement in this country that led to the banishment of slavery. Just watch Steven Spielberg's movie, Amistad. Did you know that it was devout Christians who led the civil rights movement in this country? Some would have you to think it was secular liberals who led it, but it was a church-based, faith-based movement from beginning to end. Did you know that Rosa Parks was a devout Christian and that she was chosen to kick off the bus boycott in Montgomery, Alabama because of her did you know that Jackie Robinson was a serious Christian and that Branch Rickey picked him to be the one to break the color barrier in baseball because of Jackie Robinson's faith and that Rickey himself was a Bible-thumping Christian who did what he did in part because he believed God wanted him to do it? The final. John and Andrew Irwin are brothers who grew up in a racially charged atmosphere in Birmingham, Alabama. Their movie, Woodlock, which has been in the theaters for the last several weeks, is about that time. It is not only a sports movie with a distinctly Christian message, but the Irwin brothers themselves are known as distinctly Christian directors and producers. Their movie is not only receiving rave reviews from secular critics, but it is racking up at the box office as well. Being Christian in Washington, D.C. is tough enough, but being Christian in Hollywood is near impossible, but it can be done because people like the Irwin brothers are doing what they can in an industry to which they feel called to proclaim the message of Christ and Christian values. We need more Christians, every single one of us here, who are more like the Irwin brothers. We need more Wilberforces. We need more Bonhoeffers. We need more Rosa Parks and Jackie Robinsons. And here's the catch. We're it. You and me. The problem is, we'll have to change to be it. And unless we change, you have yet to see what's going to happen. Let's pray. We get out of our stuffy traditions of going along to get along 
being removed from the culture, get engaged in the culture, let God use us where we are to make a difference where we are, but we're going to have to change. God is a change agent. So if he's in our lives, he can do it. He wants to do it. Let's pray with it does. God, our Father, I thank you that Jesus Christ is definitely a change agent. Not only did he bring about such tremendous change, many people from the religion, Jewish religion became Christians even at that time. Not only did the early apostles turn their world upside down, but the Christian movement, which was a change movement, changed the social fabric of the Roman Empire. There have been many Christian movements like that because Christians have been willing to change, not go with the flow of the times, but change their attitudes change the way they were doing things, change their disengagement from the culture and get involved and make a difference. And because of that, you did great things. But it's been a long time. Since we have seen a nation sweeping revival in this country, and we are long overdue, but we're going to have to change all of us decide that it's so important that we give of ourselves to make a difference in our culture, in our world, where we live every day. And do it intentionally. For Jesus' sake. Because that's what he's called us to do. Cultures don't change. People don't change unless Jesus changes them. He's our message. He's our model. I pray that you listen. And I pray this in Jesus' name.